what I'd like to do is I'm going to share screen tonight. I was, um, uh, and I'm going to uh, use a PowerPoint to um, go through the texts this evening. So let me go here and uh, there we go. Okay, can everybody see that? Terrific. Okay. Let me just see if I can move this out of the way. There we go. There we go. So, so what I want to do is um, I want to do a recap of what we were doing last time because some of the things that we were that we were covering last la covering last time were somewhat complex, and um, there were a few texts that I wanted to uh, to move on to uh, that I wanted to uh, complete from last time, and then we're going to begin our conversation about our learning about reincarnation. Um, and, uh, that will, uh, that should be quite exciting, but even the material we're going to be looking at, even though the first part this evening, I believe is going to be exciting. Let me just get, uh, this moving here. There we go. Okay. So in terms of recap in the first session, you'll remember that we were talking about transforming into an angel, various kinds of ascents into heaven. First, we looked at Eliyahu, and then we talked about the case of, of Hanoch, of Enoch, who is... Uh, in uh, Second Temple literature and uh, and even in rabbinic literature, understood to have been transformed into the angel Metatron. And Metatron gets described in many, many different texts. Uh, among the, the texts that we looked at was uh, Three Enoch, which is the one of the four books of Enoch that survives in Hebrew. Uh, the others are in Greek and in Slovenian uh, and other such things. Um, and, um, and then we saw how exactly he was transformed, that he would sort of blew up like fire boy with balls of fire coming out of, uh, the, the various parts of his body. Last week, what we were doing was we were looking at something that was a little bit, uh, harder to wrap our heads around. What we were talking about was Tvekut. Uh, I had, uh, titled it, uh, Becoming God, and that may have scared off some people. Um, but... And the, the, the truth is, is what we're actually talking about is, is dvekut. And what the word, you might be familiar with the modern Hebrew word devek, which means glue. But it comes from uh, the ancient understanding that one might be able to somehow cleave to God. Now, of course, the rabbi said, you can't, you can't do that. God is a flaming fire. Uh, and yet. That's what philosophers and mystics sought to do. So the two main examples that we looked at last week were the example of, of the philosopher as he's depicted by Yehuda Halevi. Uh, most of Yehuda Halevi's book, the, uh, the Kuzari, is, uh, is said in the mouth of the rabbi. It's a presentation of, of Judaism, a philosophical presentation. But it starts off with a presentation by a uh, by a Christian priest, and then by an imam, and then by a philosopher. And the philosopher talks about how uh, the ideal individual can attain uh, unity, mystical union, with what's called the active intellect. And you'll recall that I described how there are 10 different intellects, 10 different gradations that emerge from God, the last of which supervises our world. It's called the active intellect. Now, Yehuda Halevi was using that as a straw man. And he was saying, well, we don't believe that. Uh, the truth is, is that uh, the work of Diana Lobel uh, has argued that that there's there really is intense debate kut that's also taking place in Halevi. But we're not going to take a look at that right now. What we did last time afterward, though, is we looked at Maimonides and especially uh, his famous part three, chapter 51. Uh, I hope you all use that as an icebreaker uh, at parties and uh, so other social gatherings uh, in the last week. Um, and what, um, and Maimonides used a whole series of examples to talk about this, but the, the paradigms that exemplified this particular kind of experience of unification with the active intellect uh, were, were Moses right, who departs his body um, and becomes 
in a medieval philosophical sense, angelic, because the active intellect is, is what the Rambam calls an angel. It's not an angel with wings, right? It's not like the uh, the picture that I have in that top slide, um, but rather it is, uh, he says that the biblical term angel is corresponding to this kind of intellect that supervises our world. And that what the ideal person, in his case, Moshe and, and Aaron and Miriam will all die by a kiss, Avram, Yitzchak and Yaakov, what they've all done is they have perfected their minds through the study of philosophy, specifically Aristotle's metaphysics, and in so doing attain not just unity with, but identity with the active intellect. It's as if they are the active intellect. That doesn't mean that they are the totality of it, but somehow they are now a, a fully a part of it. Um, and, um, and the Rambam gives us something of a path to doing it. He talks about the meditation that one should be doing for years as one is saying the Shema and as one is engaged in one's daily prayers. That's what we covered uh, last time. Are there any questions or comments on that before we uh, before we go on? Let's grab my drink here. No, okay. Um, the fact that you're all muted makes that easier. Um, Okay, so where I want to go to next is, this is jumping to Rabbi Azriel of Girona. Um, uh, sorry, just a second, tangled here. Um, Girona in the, and I've given a date, we don't really know, uh, we, we don't really have a sense of, of what, uh, when he was born, we know that he was where it is surmised that he would died in 1238 or 1245. This is based on different kinds of uh, records from that time. So he is a uh, a slightly older contemporary of Ramban, of Nachmanides. We'll be seeing a short piece from Nachmanides later this evening. Um, and he is an important uh, Kabbalist who wrote a commentary on Talmudic legends. Um, and let me just see here, I can just show that to you. Or maybe I can just, it had been, it had been in a stack here. And anyway, um, so the, um, and what a Rabbi Israel of Girona does is that he's working with a Kabbalistic system and in the Kabbalah, in some ways similar to this notion of there being 10 gradations below God that operate the planets and the other uh, cosmic bodies. For the Kabbalists, there are 10 gradations of divinity itself, okay? Now, they're very often, they go to great pains to say this does not mean that God has parts, uh, that these are all in some sense just expressions of uh, of the same God, uh, even if one is a more muted or a more mitigated expression of divinity. And the second of those is called wisdom or chokhmah. And drawing on the verse from um, uh, 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 from uh, Mishle, from Proverbs 7, 4, where it says, you are my sister, the, sorry, the Oh, whoops, the whole thing there actually should be. Uh, the whole thing is the, is the verse, say to wisdom, you are my sister. What Rabbi Israel of Girona says is, that is to say that one should unite human thought to divine wisdom, such that they become a single entity. Okay, so let's, let's understand what's taking place here. Is the... Um, What we now have is instead of an active intellect, which is a, a kind of a derivative of God that the person is trying to attain unity with, now one is trying to attain unity with one of the what are called the spherotes, one of these 10 gradations. And in fact, it's the second highest of these gradations. 
Uh, let me just, I just want to take you to a picture. I have a picture of the steroid here. Whoops, no, not there. Uh, oh, I know where it is. Okay, let me try, let me just show you a different thing to Hold on a second. Um, let me go over here. No, it's not going to work. Never mind. Let's just go back here. I'm sorry. It. Um, uh, I had. I had a picture up, and I'm not seeing it right now. Let me see. Maybe it's here. Okay, no matter. At any rate, the actually it would be valuable for me to show this to you. I'm sorry. Let me do it like this. Let me open it like that and share screen now. New share. And there we go. Okay. So this is a, a sort of a standard picture of the spheroids. Uh, and we, what we can see are there are these ten. They're they're often depicted as spheres, but they get depicted in many different ways, uh, called keter, chokma, bina, chesek, vura, etc. We're not going to go into the details of them, uh, but I just wanted you to see that where the there is an ein sof that is above here that is utterly undescribable, and the the second of the sphere out is called chokma. Now let's go back to our to the PowerPoint. Um, and that is right here. Okay. So here we go. So when we when we said that Azriel of Girona is saying that we should uh unite with Chochma, it was with that particular image of uh that particular uh Sephira. Let's move on to the next text that I want to look at. This one's by Rabbi Yosef Jikatilia. Jikatilia lives in the uh, in the 13th cent, late 13th century, and he lives in Castile. Castile is uh, north central Spain. Uh, it's the same area in which the Zohar emerges at around the same time in the 1280s and 1290s, and this is where when scholars believe that the Zohar was mostly written. And there's a, a general consensus that Jekatilia may be one of the ones that uh, contributed some of the writing to the Zohar. This particular text, though, is called Igeret HaKodesh. Uh, we don't know exactly when it was written. It's been ascribed to different people. It's been ascribed to the Ramban. And in fact, the main way that people see it in Hebrew is in the Kitve HaRamban, the writings of the Ramban. And what the Igerita Kodesh is, is it's a Kabbalistic sex manual. Uh, and it describes the kinds of Kabbalistic uh, intentions that a, um, that a person should have when they're in, uh, having in, involved in, uh, in sexual activity. So um, uh, I've just, it's its a long treatise, and I've just picked out a couple of paragraphs to give you another piece where we're going to see how the individual is uniting with divinity. So here it says, uh, everybody here, this is R-rated, everybody here is over uh, 18, over 19, over 21. Uh, there's nothing graphic, though, and no improper words here. It says, and they should be as one in the act of the commandments. So then their thought this is the man, the you know, man and woman who are married will conjoin and become one, and the divine can dwell in between them, and they will give birth to a son according to the holy form they both will contemplate. Before I go on, this is partly drawing already on on ancient notions that a child will uh, that at the time of conception a child will resemble whatever it is that is in the minds of. Uh, the couple that is having sex. And, and in fact, you find examples of this already in the Gemara where uh, where they talk about this. But what's different here is that it gets systematized in the Middle Ages uh, with growing um, systematization of uh, medical pr medical practice and, and medical theory and uh, biological theory. They're drawing largely on Galen 
uh, and his conceptions of uh, of human physiology. Okay, so he so Jacatilia continues. Human thought has the ability to strip itself and to ascend to and arrive at the place of its source, divine wisdom. So notice that here we are at the same. We're talking about the same place, right? So that the the neshama or the mind is going to go to that place and connect with it. And then it will unite with a supernal entity when it comes and human thought and its divine source. Okay, so you've got Chochmah and Chochmah uh, become one entity. We're seeing here that it's become that it's quite explicit that there is this unification that's taking place. And when the human thought returns to its place in the human, the divine dwells in between the male and female. The divine light is drawn down and is embodied into the body of the mystic. Okay, so this is this is quite extraordinary in terms of the sense that uh, when a couple is making love, that there is this, uh, that in some sense, there is a unification with divinity that's taking place. And the child that is conceived is an expression of the divinity that was participating in the act itself. Questions, comments, horror, caution, shock, Okay, let's take a look at another one. Here we're going to, so now we're jumping to Rabbi Avram Abu Lafia. Um, now, Abu Lafia was a, a teacher of Jikatilia. Uh, you can see his dates here. Uh, he was quite prolific. Um, and he was really an odd um, character, or at least we, you know, we would think of somebody like him as an odd character. And the truth is that in his time, he was treated as a dangerous character. Uh, so let me just tell you a little bit about him. That um, Abu Lafia talked quite openly about his ability to unite with God and to become one with God, such that there was no distinction between himself and God. He talks about himself as a prophet. He talks about himself as the Messiah. Uh, and you can imagine that the rabbinic authorities were alarmed that there was this charismatic, brilliant uh, person who was, you know, teaching teachings that were, um, um, would undermine uh, much of what, um, would undermine Judaism insofar as, as if he is now the Messiah, then he becomes the one that's in charge. And they, there was great fear that he would, that bad stuff could happen. Uh, and in fact, the Rashba, Rosh Shlomo Ibn Adret, who's a student of the Ramban, uh, puts Abu Lafia into Kherim, puts his works into Kherim, right? Meaning that he excommunicates them. Abu Lafia ends up becoming itinerant, traveling around Europe. Um, and uh, what, Nonetheless, his teachings were hugely influential both on Jicatilia and on Moshe de Leon, who's often thought is the primary author of the Zohar. Uh, and even though his works were put into harem, were excommunicated, where there was a ban put on them, they start to resurface in the Kabbalah in Sfat. And at first, they're not mentioned by name. His works don't get published until the 1990s, okay, uh, because of the Rashba's ban, and then in Mayasharim, slowly, slowly they start to they start to slip out, and there's a publisher that uh, Aaron Gross that starts to publish them, until finally most many or most of them were published. Um, one last uh, story about Avram Abu Lafia. Uh, Abu Lafia felt, I mean, if you have you if you united with God and you were a prophet, and you were the Messiah, then you would feel like you knew what the truth was. And so since he was in Italy, he wrote to the Pope, and he said, hey, Pope, I'm going to come for a visit, and I'm going to explain to you why we're right and why you're wrong. And uh, the Pope gave him the um, advantage of, of, uh, of the courtesy of writing and saying, uh, we suggest that you don't come to visit. Uh, this will not end well. Uh, and nonetheless, if you think that you're a prophet and you think that you're the Messiah, then of course you're going to, you know, march on. And so he travels to Rome and he comes to Vatican City 
And he is, of course, promptly thrown into, uh, into prison. And they schedule uh, an execution date for him. And mysteriously, within three days, the Pope dies. And everybody sort of freaks out. And they say, okay, listen, just we're going to let you go. Just go away. Okay, and just don't bother us. And uh, and he goes off and he continues, uh, continues to travel. Okay. Uh, oh, it, one other very important detail about Avram Abu Lafia is that, uh, as you see here, and you've probably all cheated and read the text, uh, is that uh, this is the quote that we're going to see here is from one of is from a commentary on Maimonides' Guide of the Perplexed. The truth is, is that Abu Lafia wrote three commentaries on the Guide of the Perplexed. And moreover, for the first 50 years after the Guide of the Perplexed is published, is translated into Hebrew, because remember, it, when it comes out in 1190, when the Rambam finishes it in 1190, it's written in Judeo-Arabic. Uh, it's not published in Hebrew until about 15 years later. And um, the... Um, for the first 50 years after the translation comes out, the only commentaries on it are in uh, are by Abu Lafia. Okay, so here is a guy who thinks that he is the Messiah and thinks that he is a prophet and thinks that he can unite with God. And the only commentaries that we have for 50 years are written by him. Okay, it's just an interesting piece of reception history and of how people would have first been thinking about uh, Maimonides' God of the Perplexed because it's actually, it itself is quite a perplexing work uh, and very difficult to tease out exactly what he's trying to say. Okay, so let's see what he's saying. Uh, Abu Lafia says they, that is the human spiritual faculties will be united with it, with the active intellect after many hard, strong, and mighty exercises, until the particular and personal prophetic faculty will become universal, permanent, and everlasting, similar to the essence of its cause. And note the typography here. And he and he became one entity. Okay? So it's lowercase and uppercase. He because it is the individual who has undergone this transformation and the active intellect that are becoming one entity. But what's important to understand here is that whereas in the Rambam, it's quite clear that it is, um, it's pretty clear at any rate that it's only the active intellect. And here it is, he says explicitly that it's the active intellect uh, here in Abu Lafia, uh, with Abu Lafia, it's the, the distinction between the active intellect and God is not as clear. It's not as sharp. And it appears that it could well be that, that for Abu Lafia, it is actually God that Abu Lafia is uniting with. Let's take a look at one more text from Abu Lafia. This is from a work called Chaye Olam Haba. And here he says, the benefit of the knowledge of the name of God is its being the cause of man's attainment of the actual intellection of the active intellect. And the benefit of the act intellection of the active intellect is the ultimate aim of the life of the intellectual soul. Sounds very much like what we saw in, the, in Maimonides. And it is the reason of the life of the next world. I put next world in, in quotation marks and scare quotes, uh, and I'll explain that in a moment. This aim is the union of the soul by this intellection with God forever. Now here you see the ambiguity, right? Is at first he says, okay, you're, the intellectual soul is merging with, with, the, with the active intellect. And then he, at the end of the sentence, it's that the aim is the union of the soul with God forever. And it's partly because the active intellect is itself an aspect of God, is itself an aspect of divinity. And it's as a result of that, that the individual has now completely burst the bounds of what it means to be a human being in this union with God. 
Okay. Everybody's still here? Nobody's absconded and united with God in the meantime? Okay. Um, so what I want to do now is I want to switch gears. So we're going to move away from Dvekut. We're going to start talking about reincarnation. You ready? Here we go. So let's talk first about, about uh, the biblical roots for reincarnation. And the first play, the, what, um, it's through the act of Yibum, of leveret marriage, that Kabbalists start to talk about, um, about uh, uh, reincarnation or in the most expansive discussions of reincarnation. Uh, I'm not going to read through this whole story. This whole story, uh, I think it's probably, I'm sure it's familiar to everybody. This is the story of Yehuda's sons and Tamar. And you'll recall that uh, Yehuda had a, he, you know, he married a uh, a Canaanite woman, uh, and uh, whose name was Tamar. She had a son whose name was Er, another son named Onan, another name named Shela, and. Um, uh, and uh, you, who, I'm sorry, he didn't. Uh, yeah, so he he didn't marry Tamar, is or not yet, anyways. So Yehuda takes a wife for Er, his firstborn, and then her name was Tamar. And uh, Er, Judah's firstborn, I'm reading verse seven here, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. We don't know exactly what happened, right? It's not specified, uh, at least not yet. And Judah said unto Onan. Go into Onan, go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her and raise up seed to your brother. Onan knew that the seed would not be his. It came to pass when he went in and to his brother's wife, spilled it on the ground, lest he should give seed to his brother. Okay, so the story is familiar. How does this fit? How might this fit into reincarnation? We're going to have to wait and see. But one of the things that's taking place here is that there's a conception of identity here that is uh, perhaps a little bit different than the way that we often think about it. Very often when we give, when, uh, you know, people in our culture uh, or in, in Jewish communities at any rate, uh, have children and they name them in Ashkenaz, Ashkenazim after people who have died, Sephardim live them out, often name them after living relatives. There's an idea that there's, that hopefully they will be you know uh, that the the name will serve as a kind of a guide and as an inspiration. And sometimes people will even go so far as to say that hopefully they will actually, you know, imbibe some of those uh, the qualities that that person had. Um, but what's taking place is that there is a a kind of an extension of there's a different kind of identity in as much as. Uh, there's a certain kind of corporate identity uh, when there's when people have families. Let me give you a kind of a prosaic example. It's a practice we have at my school. Uh, after the summer, the faculty gets together, and uh, we all sort of share, uh, you know, what we did over our summer vacation. Uh, we go around in a circle. We had one faculty member who, for years, and actually mostly continuing until this day. Oh, sorry, for, for years uh, was was single and was sort of troubled that, you know, people would say, oh, well, me and my my husband, me and my wife, me and my partner went and we did this and then or we and our kids did such and such. And this faculty member who was single sort of felt like this is supposed to be about us. This is not supposed to be about like some kind of like, you know, like a whole group of people here. But. For those of us that live in families, we know that the, part of our identity is wrapped up in something a little bit bigger. It's a prosaic example. But what we're going to see is we're going to see how that gets extended by this concept of Yibum. Let's take a look at, at the next case. Here is the mitzvah of Yibum in Sefer Dvarim. Uh, if brothers dwell together and one of them dies and doesn't have a child, the wife of the dead shall not be married to, uh, unto somebody that's not part of the family. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her, take her to him to wife, perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And here comes the important line. <clears throat> and it shall be that the firstborn that she bears shall succeed in the name of his brother that is dead, that his name be not blotted out of Israel. 
Okay, so uh, I was named after my grandfather. When my parents gave me that name, it was not out of a sense like, oh, that that name would somehow be blotted out of Israel. So what is it that's taking place here? What does this mean that the name not be blotted out? There is some sense of continuity that, that and it's unspoken, it's not systematized, it's not theorized here. But there is a way in which there's some sense of continuity that will happen as a result of that wife, the the deceased's uh, wife, uh, now having a child. That somehow the family is con is continuing that line. Um, these days, the mitzvah of yibum is not practiced. Uh, we do what the Torah prescribes, uh, which is called yibum. We're not we're not going to go into that. Uh, right now, it's a way out, but it is, uh, but the halakhic literature so talks about it as being, and even the description of it, and actually the practice of it feels somewhat, uh, ups is upsetting and somewhat disgraceful. There's a sense that the brother has not fulfilled uh, his duty, and that's what gets described in the next lines after this in Sefer Dvarim. What's the most famous example of Yibum? Anybody? Ruth and Boaz. Exactly. Right? Is that is that Boaz is not a brother, but he's a kinsman and he steps in and he then continues the line. And as a result of his kindness and her kindness, uh David Amelech is the great great grandchild uh, of that union. Okay, but there's no reincarnation yet, right? Let's watch. So the term leveret from leveret marriage, which is the the uh, English term, uh, derives from the Latin levir, which means husband's brother. And the corresponding Hebrew term uh, yibum derives from the word yabam, husband's brother. Okay, so fine. That's where our terms are coming from. What I have next is the Ramban on this, on the story of, of um, Yehuda's sons and Tamar. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but the, the he says he starts off by saying that the son will be called by the name of the deceased. This is Rashi's language, but this is not true. For in the same commandments of the Torah, it likewise says, and it shall be that the firstborn that she bears shall succeed in the name of his of the his brother that is dead, that his name be not blotted out of Israel. Right? We saw that, and yet the brother-in-law is not commanded to call his son by the name of his dead brother, right? Let's just pause for a moment. If the idea is you're supposed to continue the name, you know, you're supposed to call him Jack or George or Henry. So let's call him one of those names, but that's not what happens in these stories, right? So in the case of, oh, sorry, uh, let me get rid of this. These are some words that should have been got rid of. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, that's right. In the case of Boaz, it says, Moreover, Ruth the Moabites, the wife of Machlon, <clears throat> have I acquired to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead. And what do they call him? She called him Oved. So she doesn't call him Machlon. Machlon was her husband's name, right? So what the Ramban is drawing attention to is that something else is happening here, right? It's not call about calling him Jack. It's not that the name Jack, per se, my uncle Jack died 10 months ago. Uh, it's not that the name Jack is what's important. There's something about, uh, there's something else that's taking place. So let's jump ahead a little bit here because he, and he goes on to give the same kind of uh, detail with regard to Onan, right? It says um, that what, what was Onan bothered by? It says an Onan knew that the seed would not be his. Right? There's something about the seed itself that it seems to be the concern. Ramban says this would indicate that Onan had some definite kind of knowledge in this matter, which made him certain that the seed would not be his. And the Ramban says the subject is indeed one of the great secrets of the Torah. Concerning human reproduction, it is evident to those observers who have eyes to see and ears to hear um, and then continuing over here. Now, the ancient wise men of Israel, having knowledge of this important matter, 
established it as a custom to be practiced among all those inheriting the legacy. And they called it Geula. Okay, this is a big, this is a big word, right? Redemption's a big word for marrying your late brother's wife and fathering a baby with her. Um, and the Rambine concludes his comments by saying, the man of insight will understand. So has the Ramban explained what's going on here? No. But what he has said, is he, as he often does, is he says, look, I've got a secret. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Uh, but there's something, there's, there's like some funny business. There's some smoke and mirrors uh, taking place here. And, um, and as is often the case, as is often his approach, is he is interested in Lipshot, he's interested in trying to explain things. He's he points out the problem. The problem is that it doesn't say it, it's not about the name, but he's not prepared to tell us exactly what the story is here. So let's go on. Now we're going to see what the secret is. Well, here, let's let me not uh, uh steal my own thunder yet. The the Ramban, as you know, was a uh, was is famous for and hugely influential for his commentary on the Torah, his um, commentaries on the Talmud, on his responsa, uh, on the important essays that he wrote, uh, and he was also a Kabbalist. But his Kabbalistic style more often concealed than it revealed. Sometimes when he's talking Kabbalistically, he refers to a book called Sefer Habahir, which might be translated as the Book of Brilliance uh, or the Book of Splendor. It's a very enigmatic work. Uh, and it's uh, and really it's a kind of um, anthology of mythical statements and parables. And, and it's we really don't know exactly when it was written, but it's assumed that it was probably finished being redacted, being edited in the late 12th or early 13th century. Okay, maybe like 50 years before the Ramban hits the scene. And it's one of the works that, that the Ramban quotes. Uh, it, is, it is often called the first Kabbalistic book, even though it's it's a little bit hard to call it a Kabbalistic book, but but it has Kabbalistic elements. We're going to take a look at um, what it says quite fairly explicitly about reincarnation. So as you can see, this is labeled, this is from Arya Kaplan's translation. Here it's paragraphs 121 and 122. Uh, in other versions, it's these are smaller numbers, not important right now. So it says, what is the meaning of generation to generation? Um, you know, uh, which is a, a phrase that we find in the Torah and, and elsewhere in Tanakh. And they put in the name of Rabbi Papias, who's not a well-known uh, figure in the Talmud, said a generation goes and a generation comes. Okay, well, we understand that. That's how things go, right? People die, people are born. Rabbi Akiva said, the generation came. It already came. In other words, he it's as if he trans, so Kaplan translates the verse slightly differently, instead of, gener, you know, uh, instead of halach, uh, vidor ba, is that it, or, and when it says a generation comes, it's the generation came, not that it is, not that it will come or that it is coming. And he explains it already came. What does that mean? We don't know yet. Let's take a look. What is this like? A king had slaves and he dressed them with garments of silk and satin according to his ability. The relationship broke down and he cast them out, repelled them and took his garments away from them. They then went on their own way. The king took the garments, washed the well until there was not a single spot on them. He placed them with his storekeepers, bought other slaves, and dressed them with the same garments. 
He did not know whether or not the slaves were good, but they were at least worthy of garments that he already had, and which had been previously worn. The verse continues, but the earth stands forever. This is the same as, okay, uh, another verse from, from Ecclesiastes, from Kohelet. The dust returns to the earth as it was, but the spirit returns to God who gave it. Okay. Has anybody seen this before? So this is a relatively, this is, a, it, it, this is enigmatic, but let's, let's read this carefully. So a king has slaves. This is a Jewish story. So who's the king? God, right? And he dressed them with garments of silk and satin according to his ability. If we're using this parable to explain generations coming and going, what would be the, who would be the slaves and who, what are the garments of silk and satin? It would appear that the, that the slaves would be the nishamot, would be the souls. And then they are, they come into this world with, with bodies that are just fantastic, that are capable of doing all kinds of wonderful things. And that the neshama has all kinds of, of faculties it's able to exercise. Um, and unfortunately, the relationship breaks down. Uh, he sends the slaves away, and he took, takes the garments away from them. And they went away. King takes the garments washed them well until there was not a single spot on them, placed them with the storekeepers, and got other slaves and dressed them with the same garments. So wait a second, I misread the parable, right? What's the parable saying? Is it's not that the slaves are the bodies and the garments are the, uh, it, it's, it's rather the slaves are the bodies and the garments are the neshamot, right? So that you come down and you're given this new gift a new neshama that is no i'm still not saying it yeah no that, uh, that is correct is that you're going to come down and you're going to be given a uh well you're going to be given a new chance there's going to be other slaves other people that are going to come in and they're going to inhabit those bodies it's not clear really which way to read this any ideas clearly though what's happening is that these new slaves he's got this king is hoping are going to be worthy of this new life that they're going to have but there's a recycling that's taking place and as takes place in reincarnation a soul is given a chance it doesn't work out well it's going to do it's going to come around in a different way and it's hard to know exactly what kind of system is being worked with here but clearly there's a recycling of, of humans that's taking place here in the book here. Let's take a look at one more example. Uh, I actually have got my eye on the time. Um, let's just see here. We're just gonna read part of this. Why is there a righteous person who has good or you know who receives, uh, uh, receives uh, goodness? Another righteous person who has evil, right? Tzadik Viralo, Tzadik so, you know, one person has good stuff coming to them, one person has, has bad stuff coming to them. This is a classic question of theodicy, of trying to understand why uh, the world doesn't look fair. This is because the second righteous person was wicked previously and is now being punished. Okay, they came back. And and the second person is now is now being punished in this second lifetime. So the quit text asks, is one then punished for his childhood deeds? Did not Rabbi Shimon say that in the Beit in Shamala, in the tribunal on high, no punishments is meted out until one is 20 years or older? In other words, how is it possible that if somebody died early that, that, or if somebody sinned that, that they're now going to come back and you're going to be punished for that previous lifetime? And the text says, I'm not speaking of his present lifetime. I'm speaking of what he has already been previously. So I want to just stop there just because we have now seen again that there's this notion of recycling that's taking place. So what I want to do now is I want to take a look at this famous text that is the first place where the doctrine of reincarnation gets elaborated at, at some length. 
building on the notion of yibum. Okay. You may have noticed that the Bahir doesn't draw on that, doesn't draw on lever at marriage. There's no deceased brother here. It just sort of seems to be based on whether you've been a good boys and girls or, uh, or not in terms of whether you're going to come back or have to come back. <laughs> the section we're going to be looking at now is called the Sava of, Mishpat, of Mishpatim or the Old Man of Mishpatim. And it's one of the most charming sections in the Zohar. Um, and the... Um, in it, the the section begins with the intro with two rabbis, Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Chia. They meet up on the road, and Rabbi Yossi complains that the the man who was driving a donkey behind him the whole day was just, just talking nonsense. And what is who is a donkey driver? I mean, this is the most under uh, the most unskilled labor that there is, right? What does it mean to be a donkey driver? It means you walk behind a donkey and you hit it on its rear and presumably it's carrying bags for somebody or carrying, you know, some kind of goods for somebody. Um, all you have to do is keep the donkey on the path. But what Rabbi Yechia and Rabbi Yossi discover is that this man is actually Rabbi Yesa Saba or perhaps Rabbi Nuna Saba, the greatest Kabbalist of all time. And that's what comes to be revealed. And it, this goes on for, for many, many pages of the this old man telling them Kabbalistic secrets, the most important of which is the nature of the soul and the way in which reincarnation takes place. Uh, we're obviously, we don't have time for all of this. I just want to show you a, a small section of it this evening. And very often he, this old man, he expresses... He exhorts himself to reveal secrets, but he's really torn about whether he should be revealing these Kabbalistic secrets or not. And he says, old man, old man, you're speaking these words. You don't know whether the Blessed Holy One is here and whether those who are standing here are worthy of these words. Do not fear, old man. You've already joined many battles of fierce men and you had no fear. And now you are afraid? Speak your word. For surely here are the Blessed Holy One in the assembly of Israel. And these ones here are worthy, right? He's making the argument to himself that these ones, meaning Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Chia, are worthy of hearing these secrets. Otherwise, I would not have encountered them nor begun these matters. It has to be that if, if I met them, that, that you worked it out. You wanted me to do this. So here he is speaking to himself and exhorting himself. Speak your world, old man. Speak without fear. Okay, what we're going to do now is going to read several several paragraphs uh, of his uh, his teaching about reincarnation. Um, we are coming into the middle of this this longish story, and for a while he's been talking about the nature of souls, the different faculties of the soul, uh, the souls of converts. That's not what is interesting us this evening. So here he says, a spirit leaving this world who has not grown or spread in this world, let's just stop there for a moment. What does it mean that a person who hasn't grown or spread in this world, meaning somebody who hasn't procreated, right, who hasn't had at least one child, undergoes rolling, meets Galgel, okay, and finds no rest. His soul is in torment comes revolving into the world like a stone in a sling until it finds a redeemer to redeem it. So remember that Boaz is referred to as a redeemer and that the uh, Azrael text, sorry, not the Azrael text, the, uh, uh, the Bahir text that we saw was also talking about a certain kind of redemption. So by that very vessel that he used, uh, okay, let's pay close attention, until it, right? So this is the, the uh, a, a man has died without bearing, without fathering a child, and his soul is tormented until it finds, his soul finds a redeemer to redeem it. By that very vessel that he used, which, what is the vessel here? This is his wife. 
okay, so that he had, um, you know, been intimate with his wife, and yet there was no, uh, you know, there was no conception that took place, or no, no child can't that emerged. And this, who is this, this woman to which he clung with his spirit and soul, right? Is it may well have been very much in love. And who was his mate? Spirit with spirit. Okay. And that redeemer builds it as before. Okay. So along comes the brother-in-law, right? He, and he's going to redeem, as it were, his brother's soul. He marries the wife. And what does he do is he builds it, builds his, his brother's soul as before. Okay, so what's going on here? Let's continue, we'll see. The spirit that he left, this is the original, the, this is the deceased, adhering to that vessel is not lost. Somehow, okay, so in other words, somehow in that guy, the deceased, left something of his neshama in his wife. Um, it is said that when, uh, that if a, if a man marries a widow, or if if two people who are divorced, uh, you know, get married, that it's as if there's four people in bed, um, right? Because it's as if they've both brought, you know, uh, histories with them. But here there's something very literal about it. Uh, so he, there's a part of him that is was left with his, with his widow. And the old man says, for nothing in the world, be it ever so small, lacks a place. In which to be hidden and absorbed it is never lost okay so it's not as if the soul died but because it didn't you know father a child it is stuck there with that with the woman consequently the spirit that he left in that vessel with his wife is there and this pursues the root and basis from which it issued let's see what that means it brings it and builds it in its place so here is the redeemer and he and he is building both with the new child that he's going to be having and with the old with the husband's soul that is somehow still there and builds it in its place in the womb of the of the widow in the abode of the spirit of his mate who emerged with him and it is built there as before so what's it saying here is that the deceased who is the child that's going to be that is going to be born it's the deceased he's coming back this is a new creature now in the world a new spirit and a new body it's a little bizarre and he's going to continue um now you might say this spirit is the same as it was this is so but is built only by virtue of the other spirit there he left in that vessel Okay, so so what's happening here? Is it part of the guy remained with the widow, and along comes the redeemer, and he's he, they he has sex with this with the widow, and now a new soul is brought in to complement that original soul. Okay, this is getting awfully complicated, um, and so I want to jump here. Well, let's let's read through it. Um, this spirit, this structure that is built, is built only by that only by that spirit that he left there in that vessel, beginning to be built. It attracts the spirit that roams naked, drawing it. There are two spirits that are one. Okay, so this is pretty crazy, right? Is it now this new child somehow has two spirits, not just one? Afterwards, this is spirit and that is soul, and the two of them are one. Um, and uh, let's go on. Okay, good. And so now the old man goes, he says, look, this one has another body constructed now anew, right? Because it's now a new child, right? It's going to be born and, you know, grow up. The first body, what becomes of it? Either one or the other is in vain. So now the old man is... He's got a problem, right? He says, wait a second. Is here you have this, this previous soul, and he has now inhabited two bodies. There was the first body and the second body. And 
And now he's a little bit bothered. He's like, maybe like one of these bodies, you just said that nothing is created in vain, but it appears that now only one of these bodies is really necessary for the soul, right? According to human understanding, it follows that the earlier one who did not complete itself, himself at first vanishes, right? That's what makes sense. Guy died and now you get a new person since he did not prove himself worthy, by which he means he didn't, wasn't successful to father a child. If so, it was for nothing that he engaged in the commandments of Torah, even if just one of them, right? That poor Shmo is all the mitzvot that he did in his life, but he didn't father a child. And so like that was like useless. And we know that even the emptiest in Israel are as full of mitzvot as a pomegranate. So was all of that for nothing? And so now the old man is like really... Uh, you know, he's at odds with himself and is troubled. He says, companions, companions, open your eyes, for I know you think and perceive so, right? It's like, he thinks like they must be having the same problem so that all those bodies are marked in vain, lacking existence forever. And he says, don't worry, not so. Far be it from us to contemplate such things. And now he will give, in our remaining time, he will give the solution to this problem. That first bet body he left is not lost. It will have existence in the time to come. It has suffered various sorts of its punishments. Blessed Holy One does not withhold the reward of creatures that he's created. Uh, those the Blessed Holy One turns into other creatures so the body will not be constructed in a human image and will never rise. What does the Blessed Holy One do? Is the Redeemer who redeems him that spirit of his that he infused there. Okay, so now what's happening? Here's a guy and a gal and, and a widow. They come together and he infuses spirit into the woman, joining and mingling with the spirit that was already there in that vessel that is not lost. And now what do you have? You've got three spirits uh, in that are now in this child somehow. One that was in the vessel, right, in the woman and remained there. Another, the one drawn there that had been naked, right? This new one. And another, the one that the Redeemer infused there, mingling with them. And now he just says, like, this is ridiculous, right? This is impossible. And so he, he begins to conclude, these are the supernal mighty acts of the Holy King and nothing is lost. Even a breath of the mouth has a place and location. The blessed Holy One makes of it what he wishes even a human word and even a voice. Nothing at all is in vain. Everything has a place and location. And But things now start to get even weirder though. This one who was just constructed emerges into the world as a new creature. He has no mates, right? This child. For this one, no proclamation is made because his mate has been lost to him, right? His mother, the, wait a second, the, the widow, is no longer his, right? It's the brother that is now with the widow. His former mate has become his mother and his brother, his father. Okay, so this is really messed up, right? And he goes on and on to try to resolve this problem, trying to figure out the the economics of this really, of like, how do you, how is all of this going to be juggled? And here's where I'm going to leave you with the Sava's Lament says, old man, old man, what have you done? Silence would have been better for you. Old man, old man, I told you, you've set to the great sea without ropes and without a sail. What will you do? If you say that you will rise above, you cannot. If you say that you will descend below, look, the depth of the great abyss. What will you do? So what I recommend that you do is you come back next week. And we will, next week, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some texts that talk about uh, the different kinds of creatures that one can become, uh, other people, other the way and the purpose of coming, becoming other people, becoming reincarnated into other kinds of animals. And finally, we'll look at, at a couple of texts in which all of nature gets disrupted. And the human being is really is perhaps no longer the crown of creation, but really all of creation is a crown. And our status sort of fluctuates within a much broader uh, matrix uh, of reality. And with that, this old man says goodnight. Thank you so much. Looking okay. forward. Okay, great. <laughs>
Have a great week. Hopefully we'll see you next week. Bye. Thanks.